Hello, everyone. This is Gabriel. I'm broadcasting from Dubai. And in Waco, Texas, is Professor David Wilhite. He is the author of a book, um, which we'll be speaking about today, which is The Gospel According to Heretics. Hello, Professor. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. So before we move on, let me show very quickly the cover of your book, The Gospel According to Heretics, Discovering Orthodoxy Through Early Christological Conflict. So if anybody goes to a bookstore or through Amazon, they, after hearing this conversation, they know what, uh, what to find. So there in this go. book, you talk about many heretics, but I want to focus because I've been reading and I, I found it uh, fascinating. I want to focus on the history of three particular church councils uh, that you discuss in your book, which is the first the Council of uh, Ephesus, then a second Council of Ephesus, which was canceled, I suppose, or declared a robber council, and then the Council of uh, Chalcedon. So why don't we be begin with the most important figure that you discuss in, in the chapter dedicated to that book, which is uh, Nestorius. Who was Nestorius and what was he saying? Sure, well, so Nestorius is the church leader. Uh, he eventually is appointed as the, the, the archbishop or patriarch of Constantinople. And so remember by that time around 400, Constantinople is where Constantine had moved the Roman capital there. So it's, it's one of, if not the most important cities in the empire and he is their bishop. Um, some background for him that's important is there were there were around the Mediterranean world Christians sort of had different tendencies and how they would talk about Jesus Christ and the Antiochene school as it's often been called uh, Nestorius is from Antioch so he represents that Antiochene school and yet he brings it to Constantinople and some of the things he said probably sounded foreign it was different emphases than what other people had and this this is where he gets into trouble Right. And what was his doctrine? What was he saying that caused so much trouble and so much scandal to other people, especially the people in Alexandria who, who view it differently, right? Yeah, well, what he eventually ends up saying, or at least is heard to say, allegedly said, is that Christ is actually a, a composite of two persons. And what he certainly would emphasize was the two natures of Christ. So Christ is believed in, in Christian uh, theology that Christ is fully human, so he has a human nature, and fully divine, so he has a divine nature. But what Nestorius seemed to have done in speaking of, of human, you, instead of nature, you could change the word being, so he's a human being, and he's a divine being. Well, now, if there's a human being named Jesus, and there is this divine being, the Son of God, in Nestorius' teaching, it sounded like you're talking about two different people altogether, as if one possessed the other, right? And um, now, where he started, though, was much simpler. It was about Jesus's mother, Mary. Hmm. And there was a debate as to what, what's the proper title for Mary. Uh, some wanted to call her mother of God because they believe Jesus was God, God, God's son, so divine. Um, and Nestorius refused to say that. He said she's the mother of Christ. And the, the rest of the church wanted to insist, if Jesus is God, God the son, then she must be mother of God. And yeah, that's that's where the controversy really began was was with Mary, right? So, but by this time, the, the doctrine of the Trinity was already established, right? So this wasn't really about right. the doctrine of the Trinity. I mean, everyone in, in the Christian world agreed that God was three persons. The thing yeah. is about what to do regarding Christ as a person. Is he just one or or two? And apparently, you're saying that Nestorius believed that he was two. That's right. That's at least what it sounded like. You got to remember, there's a lot of translation going on from Greek to Latin, and even Nestorius represents this Syrian tradition. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, Cyril is going to come from Egypt, and he represents this Coptic tradition. And so, yes, he he's heard to say two persons, and the, the, you're right. No one no one is de denying that God is triune. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons. But the question is, when God the Son became incarnate. In Jesus Christ, Nestorius seemed to be saying that God the Son was this divine person who just came down and rested upon or indwelt this human being named Jesus. And that's what the rest of the church couldn't abide. 
Right. So take us to this controversy regarding uh, the virgin. So who was who was saying that she should only be called the mother of Christ and who was saying that she should be called? No, no, no. She is the mother of God. I mean, how did this controversy yeah. begin and, and why did the virgin become so important here? Yeah, well, OK, so we could I'll start with the last part of your question. Why did the virgin become so important? So all the way back to the, the New Testament scriptures, Mary plays an important role um, it was prophesied in Isaiah that a virgin would conceive and bring forth a child, and his name will be Emmanuel, which is Hebrew for God with us. So if Mary is the one who bears God with us, Mary from very early on was revered or honored, and she has a sort of a, a theological role. Very early on, early Christians are talking about how Mary was the vessel through whom God chose to bring his son into the world. So she, she already has an important role. It's the technical title that's being debated by Nestorius's time. And again, in Constantinople, when, when Nestorius arrives, there are already people who are calling her mother of God, but there are other people who are pointing out the technical, the technical problem that seems to be there. Mary did not give birth to God as God, right? She didn't exist before all time. She wasn't in heaven, the one whom God the Father bore, God the Son, in, in his divine nature. So the, the locals were saying in Constantinople, we should call Mary the mother of man because she gave birth to the man, Jesus, even though God, the son's divine nature was also united to Jesus. So Nestorius doesn't side with them, but nor will he side with the mother of God title. So you've got mother of man, mother of God. He thinks mother of Christ is this perfect compromise. Uh, and he probably was well-meaning there but that's where, uh, as we've mentioned a couple of times, Cyril of Alexandria steps in and he uses this and he, he finds Nestorius' meaning to be sinister and he accuses him of, of heresy here. He should say, he, Nestorius should say mother of God because Jesus is God. Right. Now, you mentioned in the book that Nestorius, he, he was intolerant towards uh, other religious groups, even in Constantinople, right? Because as soon mm -hmm. as he became patriarch, one of the things he did was to persecute Arians uh, that were still around in, in, in Constantinople, right? And I guess that eventually this intolerance came back to haunt him because he became, yeah. he went from victimizer to, to being a victim himself. So let's move on towards the controversy itself and find out how Nestorius became, I don't know if to call it a victim, but at least, you know, on the receiving end of, a, of persecution or excommunication. And you bring in, uh, Cyril of Alexandria. Tell us a little bit about this very colorful character. He is a colorful character. So Cyril, uh, Alexandria, you have to remember, even though Constantinople is sort of new Rome, it's the new capital of the empire. Long before that, Alexandria as a political city has always been called second only to Rome. It's the second most powerful city, most wealthy city. And the Christians there, recognize, Christians around the empire recognize Alexandria as, in a sense, that sort of importance because Peter, the disciple of Jesus, was in Rome. Mark was said to be Peter's translator, allegedly wrote the Gospel of Mark. He was the first patriarch of, of Alexandria. So Cyril comes from this long line of bishops of Alexandria, patriarchs of Alexandria, who thought themselves really sort of the guardians of orthodoxy. Uh, only after Rome do they, you know, uh, rank in importance. And so when Cyril sees Nestorius up here in Constantinople, also claiming to be New Rome, it's... Um, you know, he, he's really following what his uncle, uh, Theophilus, who had also been patriarch, had, 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 he had, his uncle had prosecuted another patriarch of Constantinople. Yeah, so yeah Cyril, that, that, I think you should, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that, you, tell yeah. us a little bit more about that incident. You're talking about John Chrysostom, I suppose, right? That's correct. But, yeah. and, and, you know, few people talk about this, uh, but I think this is a very important uh, context because, I mean, if Cyril sees what Theophilus is capable of doing, Again, someone in Constantinople, he's thinking, I can also do the same, and this is my time to shine, right? So yeah. tell us a little bit about how was it that Theophilus uh, dethroned or, or, or removed uh, John Chrysostom from, from Constantinople? How did this coup take place? Yes, well, again, so the John uh, Chrysostom is the patriarch of Constantinople a generation earlier before Nestorius. Theophilus is the patriarch of, uh, of Alexandria a generation before Cyril, and Chrysostom is accused of teaching some various things as heresy and, uh, and Theophilus comes and arrives on, there, there's a council to be held 
Um, and at these councils, you would always rank the bishops. So who is sort of most in importance? They get to speak first and the, the highest rank would preside over the whole uh, meeting. Well, it just so happened that the Bishop of Rome never attends these Eastern councils. Uh, he always sends a representative, but since he's ranked first as the successor to Peter, he never, he, he's not there and can't preside. So who gets to, who's ranked second? Theophilus Patriarch of Alexandria. And so what happens is that immediately turns uh, Chrysostom is to basically being on trial. So it's not, no longer just a council debating this. Chrysostom said one thing or allegedly said a few things and he's put on trial and uh, he's found guilty under Theophilus's forceful, forceful persuasion. He brings monks with him. They seem to be intimidating anybody who would vote against Theophilus. And Chrysostom is deposed. He's, he's removed as bishop, uh, patriarch of Constantinople uh, and sent into exile and dies from his severe treatment. And later history sort of bears out that Chrysostom was innocent of the charges, but the evidence at the council that was allowed by Theophilus, uh, he looked guilty. And so later Christians often remember Chrysostom as a hero, but see that as sort of a tragic, unfortunate trial that he was put on. So now you're right, when Cyril comes on the scene and Nestorius seems to be making the same mistakes in Constantinople, Cyril thinks it's his duty to carry out this same role as guarding orthodoxy. Right. So how does the new coup take place or, or how does Cyril orchestrate this against Nestorius? Who does he appeal to and what are his tactics? Yeah, okay. So there's a few stages here. So the, the first is when Nestor, when um, th there's some, there's all sorts of, you know, people travel back and forth between these cities. And there seems to be evidence that Nestorius had actually accepted some, some monks and some people that Cyril had, had uh, chastised. And Cyril probably takes this, it seems to take this personally. And so when Cyril finds out that Nestorius is using this formula, mother of Christ, not mother of God, Cyril demands that Nestorius explain himself which uh, at first seems like a, just an honest question, tell me what you believe about Jesus. But what clearly happens is once Nestorius has to go on the defense and start explaining what he believes about Jesus, Cyril wants to put this on trial. So Cyril stage one forwards Nestorius's statements to uh, the Bishop of Rome and uh, the Bishop of Rome, Pope Leo, uh, is going to side with him eventually. And yet uh, they're, they're all appealing to Rome. Nestorius does the same thing. And so what happens is they have to put on a council to decide what's right about this. Well, once again, the Bishop of Rome never shows up. Uh, he sends a representative. Cyril does show up and he is the ranking bishop. So he gets to preside. And Nestorius, even though he's patriarch of Constantinople, he's actually put on trial at this council. <laughs> now, st stage two, I'm trying to, I'll try not to make this a long answer, but the second phase is the council itself. I mean, you say a coup. Cyril would think that what he's doing is perfectly legal, but there were complications in this council. So the emperor is the one who actually always issues the summons for bishops to attend the council. The emperor's representative is supposed to supervise. And yet uh, the representatives from the West, from, from the Pope had not shown up yet. Uh, and the representatives from Antioch who supported Nestorius were not able to make it yet. And some people thought they were delaying on purpose. But uh, after two weeks of being late, after the start date the emperor had said the council should start by, uh, when these other parties still aren't there, Cyril starts the council anyway. So now everyone at the council, except Nestorius, is on Cyril's side because the others aren't there. And Nestorius refuses to even attend. And so they put Nestorius on trial uh, without Nestorius even being there, find him guilty, and then the others show up. And of course, they refuse to recognize that this council was valid because not everyone was there. They try to have their own council, and um, it gets so, it just so gets to, it's a really was, messy history after Nestorius that. Nestorius was being judged in abstention, as we would say, right? I mean, he yes, wasn't there, true. so the, it's not a, like a, let's say. I, I mean, I don't know what the ecclesiastical proceedings would have been in the fifth century, but today that would be outrageous, I suppose, right? I mean. <laughs> Largely, I mean, again, in Cyril's defense, what Cyril would say is he was invited to come, he refused to come defend himself. So what they judged him on was his written statements. So, I mean, I suppose, you know, in a trial Yeah, but today, I suppose he was refused... cherry picking too, right? Oh, there, sure. there was some yeah. cherry picking going on. Yeah, that's right. So if in a normal trial, if someone read what I said, if I'm put on trial, if they read what I said, I would have the chance to say, well, that's not what I meant. Read the whole context. Nestorius wasn't there and didn't have the chance to do that. Um, so if he had been there, he probably still would not have been given a fair trial. But you see, the idea is Cyril would say Nestorius could have come and defended himself. He chose not to. Right. 
Now, the city of Ephesus, which is where this council takes place, uh, you mentioned there in the book that it has a lot of significance because it's associated with the Virgin herself, right? And, and according yes. to Christian tradition, uh, uh, John the Evangelist, uh, who according to you know traditional uh, belief is the same as John the Apostle, they eventually went to Ephesus and that's where the Virgin died or according to Catholics, you know, she has went to heaven and in body right. and soul. So, I mean, whose decision was it to take it to Ephesus? Because if this whole uh, dispute, uh, in this whole dispute, the, the, the role of the Virgin plays a big role and the people in Alexandria want to magnify uh, the role of the Virgin, then it would seem that the city of Ephesus would be in favor of the Alexandrian uh, position, right? Because uh, if they want, uh, if, if the people in Alexander are saying that the Virgin is the mother of God, well, that takes her to a higher status. Right. And this city being associated with the Virgin somehow also increases in status. So the choice of Ephesus seems to be biased in favor of, of the Alexandrian side. So whose decision was it to place it there? You know, I'd have to double check. I, I think this is, I think what we know of the records is when the emperor issues the edict for people to meet at a council, it takes place in Ephesus. So I, I'm not sure if I know who convert, convinced the emperor to do this, but you could, you could imagine sort of um, Cyril is the one asking for this. You could imagine his representative saying, hey, by the way, this would be a really good place. I mean, <laughs> it definitely favors him. Now, um, Nestorius doesn't seem to be worried about the location at first because you know, technically, he thinks he's exalting Mary. He's still honoring Mary, praying to Mary, all of those things. And to call Mary Mother of Christ is still a pretty honorable title. Uh, and also, the Bishop of Ephesus would still only get one vote. But you're you're right to point out just the the fact that um, in the, yeah, in the but it's like home John, club home club advantage in sports, right? <laughs> probably, yes, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yes. Um, again, Nestorius doesn't. And Nestorius isn't afraid of honoring Mary. So he, Nestorius may not have recognized that sort of home court advantage. But yes, if this is where, uh, I was going to say in the Gospel of John, uh, on the cross, Jesus looks at John, the, the beloved disciple, who's traditionally thought to be John the Apostle. Um, Jesus looks at him and says uh, about Mary, behold your mother. So this is his way of making sure John takes care of his own mother, Mary. So according to later tradition after the New Testament, John settles in Ephesus, as you said, Mary must have been there, completed her life there. So there is a church devoted to Mary, and that is the church in which this trial takes place. Mm -hmm. So how dare you speak anything less of Mary than she is worth? I mean, you're right. This, this, this probably was a very powerful setting that stacked the deck against Nestorius. Right, right. So you're saying that we have two parallel consuls going on at the same time. So first, the, when Cyril arrives, and then when the other people arrive, and they have their own consul. So how is this settled? And, and, and who does the emperor favor at the end? Yeah, they're almost parallel. They don't quite overlap. So Cyril completes his council, and only then does John of Antioch show up and, and recognize, uh, refuse to recognize that council and starts his own council, a very short one, where uh, they, they vote in favor of Nestorius. So the emperor actually <laughs> requires all the bishops to go home. He realizes this has been a, a, a disaster. Uh, and he, except he keeps Nestorius and Cyril in, in the city on house arrest. And then the records are just incredibly vague. Somehow Cyril is able to go home and declare victory. And uh, it's really when the Pope from the, the West writes in in favor of Cyril versus Nestorius, that seemed to be what did it. But exactly how Cyril was allowed to leave and Nestorius wasn't and, and how the emperor finally made his decision is, is unclear. Um, but the aftermath becomes more clear. So once the, the emperor sides with Cyril, even John of Damascus, that the Bishop of Antioch who was, was siding with Nestorius, he actually comes to have a, uh, a, an agreed statement between him and Cyril. So they're able to work out how, how to talk about Christ together and allegedly, if John of the Antioch is representing Nestorius, allegedly, I mean, you, it, you can assume Nestorius would probably agree to those same formula, the same way of talking about Christ. So Nestorius, in principle, should be seen as not a heretic since his representative was able to say all the right orthodox things and was not a heretic. But Nestorius was never given that chance. He was already exiled and he basically uh, dies as a, uh, he, he's put into a monastery far, far away and is never allowed to kind of have a public voice again. 
Right, but there is there is a branch of Christianity that persists to this day. That's called Nestorians, right? So who are they, and 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 how did they follow uh, Nestorius' teachings in the first place? Yeah, great. So they don't call themselves Nestorians. They were called Nestorians by their opponents. So what would be today uh, Orthodox Christianity, Catholic Christianity, that tradition. Uh, yeah, the Nestor so-called Nestorian church had branched off of that. And that's because they, they really existed largely further east than the Roman Empire. So beyond the reach of the emperor in Constantinople, in the Persian Empire, there were many churches who looked at these councils and said, this is not any different than what we believe. We agree with what Nestorius is saying. And so they sided with Nestorius, defended him. Um, and yeah, th th throughout history, I mean, all the way into modern times, there there is... There are branches of this group now. So what's called the, the Church of the East, and it's broken into several subdivisions, the Assyrian Church, the Chaldean Church. These are Christians that continue to this day. Most of them speak uh, 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 a form of Syriac. And yeah, they have continued to defend the story as has given a, a unfair trial. Uh, and in 1994, there was actually a reconciliation between the Roman Catholic Church and their representative from the East, and both are able to say that Mary is the mother of Christ, who is our God. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, they don't like saying mother of God in that sort of blunt way that Cyril did, but they believe the same things that Cyril and the rest of Christianity uh, seems to believe. Right. Well, when I read your book and some other books on this issue, I mean, it seems to me that Nestorius was speaking with conviction. He, he really believed what he was saying. He was willing to go to, into exile and so on, right? Now with the case of Cyril, <laughs> I'm not so sure because <laughs> there is a big political context behind this. And I mean, you objected to the word coup a, a while ago and that, that, that's fine. Uh, but it does seem to me that, I mean, I don't know how much theology and how much politics were involved in this. Uh, the, the, uh, someone, a cynical reader, and I consider myself one of those sometimes, might see here a lot of opportunism on, on the side of Cyril in order to orchestrate this scoop. So in your opinion as a scholar, how much was it theology and how much was it politics for Cyril? Yeah, well, at times I'm a cynical reader as well. So I, I, you, you can use the word coup. Uh, he, the, the, the politics and the theology go hand in glove. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think what we always ha have to do, uh, here, here's what I always try to do as a scholar, is I always try to take this sort of, um, let's, let's say, uh, critical stance and say, it looks, you know, here, if you really ask the hard questions, it looked like Cyril is trying to defend Alexandria's status as second to Rome, and he's using any opportunity he can to lower, diminish Constantinople's status. Um, so that's fair. I think we have to acknowledge that's happening. But then I think you also have to try to read closely what Cyril says in a, in a sympathetic way and say, if you read Cyril's uh, letters, he too is sincere. He believes what he's doing is right, even if he can leverage it for opportunistic reasons. He, uh, he, is, he is defending the tradition going back to famous, famous uh, leaders in Alexandria. Like I mentioned his uncle Theophilus, before that was Athanasius, the famous defender of orthodoxy mm. against Arius. Uh, all the way back to St. Mark himself. So Cyril thinks he's doing what he's called to do. And yes, there is political opportunism taking place there. And there's political heavy handedness. As I say, he brings these monks with him who are really, I mean, they have their like staffs that they would use to walk that are seem to be threatened to beat people with. And at the next council of Ephesus, they will be used to beat after Cyril. Um, so there's no doubt that there is far too much political power uh, involved and abused. And yet, I don't think that dismisses the sincerity and the theological convictions on both sides. Right. OK, let's move on to the next chapter then, which is the okay. second council of, uh, of, uh, of Ephesus. Uh, a few years pass, and this uh, strange character, Eutychus, I think it's pronounced. Uh, you, probably uh, Eutyches. But, Eutyches. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he comes off saying some heretical stuff too. So what was Eutyches saying and, and what happened after that? Right. Okay. So Eutyches is a, a, a leader in Constantinople. He's not the patriarch. He, he, he basically oversees the monasteries there. Um, and in seeing how people are responding to Nestorius, he, uh, okay, Eutyches is rejecting Nestorius, so he sides with Cyril, 
and trying to sort of explain the better way of speaking about Christ, he, that's where he gets into trouble. So he doesn't just reject Nestorius. Nestorius allegedly said that Jesus is two persons, Jesus the human, God the son. Eutyches wants to make sure these are one and the same, so far so good. And he does it by saying these two natures were so united together, human nature, divine nature, that they end up being mixed together. Fused together would be fine. Infused together is probably what he's kind of saying. Uh, he's heard of saying confused with each other. So if they're mixed or confused, well, now, uh, when the word of this gets out, it's very easy for Pope Leo in the West uh, to say, that's not the way we want to talk about Christ at all. There's no confusion in Christ. Um, so the analogy would be, if you take something like a uh, horse and a donkey and breed them together, you have a mule. But uh, if you remember, a mule is a mutant. Mules can't have baby mules because they are neither horse nor donkey. And if Eutyches is right, then the, Christ, the statement about Jesus would say that Jesus takes human nature and divine nature, and in Christ they're confused with each other, mixed together, and you have Christ, but now you would be Christ who's not human nor divine. He's this mutant third right. thing. He's like Hercules or something. Half on something half. between God and humanity. Yeah. So, so Christians quickly, many Christians quickly reject and say, we, we, can't, we can't say he's a demigod or half human, half God. He, he's, he's always been declared to be fully human, and he's always been declared to be fully divine. So what Eutyches is getting at doesn't, doesn't work. All right. And what's the reaction against Eutyches? Oh, yeah. So same history repeats itself. Cyril is dead. His successor now, Dioscorus, uh, is, is conscious, uh, patriarch of Alexandria. And so he summons a trial, requests a trial again. And uh, Flavian is the patriarch of Constantinople who defends Eutyches. So now uh, at this council, Eutyches and Flavian of Constantinople end up being put on trial. And it's the same sort of heavy-handed tactics. Uh, they just get worse. So this time, Dioscorus thinks he's right to bring all of his monks. Allegedly, he had a thousand monks surrounding the church, including military guards sent from the emperor. And he would not let anyone in or out until they voted and decided which way they were going. And anyone who voted against him allegedly were beaten with, with these staffs and, uh, and, and taken immediately out into arrest because they're heretical. Um, and Flavian himself uh, was beaten so badly that when he was taken into exile afterward, he, he died within weeks, I think. Of, of... Oh, I think, wait, I'm not hearing you, but no, it's, it might be a problem with connection. Speak again. No, I can't hear you. Uh, oh. There we go. Okay, now I hear oh. you. Go ahead, please. Now I'm back in. Okay. Yes. Should I back up a bit and talk about? Uh... Yeah, you were you were talking about Flavian and how he died. Yeah. Okay. So so Flavian is at this council to, to determine whether Eutyches is right or wrong. But Flavian has defended Eutyches, and so now Flavian, patriarch of Constantinople, is also put on trial, also condemned. And uh, now Dioscorus, the successor to Cyril, is the one who's running this council and thinks he's doing the exact same thing as Cyril before him and Theophilus before him, and they use heavy-handed uh, techniques. They have a thousand, allegedly have a thousand monks surrounding the church. They don't let anybody in or out with that until they vote the, the correct way, and if they vote the wrong way, they're beaten and put into prison and then taken off into exile. So Flavian himself is condemned, and, and during his arrest, he's beaten so severely that he, is, he later dies from his wounds. And uh, when the Again, the, the Pope at this time, Pope Leo I, later called Leo the Great, uh, he sends his letter that's supposed to be read at this council, but Dioscorus of Alexandria would not allow it. And so when Leo finds out, he declares it a robber synod, um, and it's not a real council. And what was his letter saying? It, it was condemning his, Eutyches, I suppose. His, that's right. His letter was condemning Eutyches, saying saying exactly what I did earlier about the, the, the sort of hybrid idea mm. of uh, like, a, like a demigod, like Hercules, that, that this doesn't work. In fact, Leo is somewhat sympathetic. He doesn't think uh, Eutyches is so much a heretic as he is an idiot. He, he just thinks that Eutyches is an old man who doesn't understand the poor logic he's using. But nonetheless, it has to be rejected. And so he writes this letter rejecting uh, Eutyches and telling the right view of things. And then the one more little sort of important note to add to that is when Leo describes the right way to talk about God, he actually sounds a lot like Nestorius <laughs> from that earlier council. He won't, 
he certainly won't say Christ is two persons, right? Jesus, the human God, the son, but he does talk about the two natures of Christ. Jesus is uh, humanity, Christ divinity. And, and that is what keeps you from having a confusion like Eutyches has. Jesus is still fully human and still fully divine. 100% of both natures. Uh, and so when people read this, you know, from Alexandria, who are defending like the tradition of Cyril, they're not going to let anything that sounds like Nestorius be read at this council. And so it's completely shut down and rejected. And then it's afterward that the Pope is able to appeal and have another council where the trial starts all over. And it's, it's the people who are in Alexandria who are then put on trial. Right. So this Dioscorus, I mean, he was even more ruthless than Cyril, apparently. So he, I mean, like he, it, yeah. he, more he, violent. right. So he was taking basically monks, but who behave like thugs, I suppose. Right. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. So, so far we've had two consuls, uh, the first consul of Ephesus, mm -hmm. a few years later, the second consul at, at Ephesus. Now you're saying that uh, Leo uh, had sent a letter. This letter was not read, but as you describe it in the book, it seems to me that Leo is not the one calling the shots here. The papacy at this point is not such a powerful institution. The one calling the shots is really the emperor, right? So, okay. he's, the, yeah. so he's the one who decides, okay, this council is accepted, this one is not accepted, right? I mean- and, and Well, yeah, yes and no. The only complication there is the emperors, the emperors are the ones who formally call the council and supervise the council um, but the sort of dirty little secret about the Christian emperors is they almost never got their way. So they're still not happy with the results of the council. Um, and so they, their, their only hope is to form new councils later. Um, but yeah, so the, and back to the Bishop of Rome in particular, um, I think even, even devout Roman Catholics would admit, Roman Catholic historians certainly would admit that the, the office of the papacy is one that evolved, that early on, no, the, the Pope wasn't able to really govern the whole church because, you know, before Constantine, they were under threat of persecution, travel and communication was limited. And so as the church uh, continues to develop through the ages, the Bishop of Rome starts to have more and more influence. But we're still at the time where no one thought that the Bishop of Rome ruled the church single handedly. And so Leo the Great is called Leo the Great because he's the first Pope to really act like a Pope the way you and I would think of it. And he first does so in the West. He thinks he's in control of the entire Latin West, and he and largely he is. Um, and then what we're going to see is at, at this council uh, of Ephesus, the second council, because he rejects it, it's his influence that brings about the, the next one, the Council of Chalcedon, which is declared Orthodox. So you see Leo's influence is growing here. This is where the Bishop of Rome does start to have not absolute authority yet, but lots of influence. Yeah, but I think you mentioned in the book that were it not for the death of the emperor, who was uh, Theodosius II, he fell from a mm -hmm. horse and died, a totally con contingent event. I mean, <laughs> he could have gone <laughs> another way, right? Uh, yeah. That's why the, the, the Council of Chalcedon is called, right? So, so far, it seems that uh, Emperor Theodosius II accepts the results of the second council of Ephesus. And it seems like that's the end of the story. Uh, but then he dies and right. a new right. emperor comes and that's what opens the door for maybe yet another council to be called because uh, I think as you discuss in the book, one of the sisters of the empress, Pulcheria, mm -hmm. uh, she was not happy with the way things were going in the second council of Ephesus. So she was, an, she was aligned with the Pope in theological opinions, I suppose. So yeah. she's saying, okay, now that my brother is dead, now that there is a new <laughs> emperor, we can again open this chapter and call for, for a new council. So, I mean, I, I see your point that yes, uh, like uh, the uh, Pope Leo is beginning to grow in power, but were it not for the death of that particular emperor, uh, things might not have changed, right? I mean, I don't know if you share that opinion, but it, that's yeah, the way well, it seems it's, to me. It's, it's, it's impossible to know for sure. That's the problem is if you imagine sort of counterfactual history, what, what would have happened if uh, Theodosius II lived a long life? Hmm. I, here, here's my hunch. I don't think Leo would have ever accepted the Council of Ephesus. I think you would have had a split. It's just the West would have split, splintered from Constantinople at that time. Hmm. Um, and then who knows, maybe after some time, the pressure would have gotten to Theodosius II 
and he would have conceded to have another council. I mean, that, that's where it's just impossible to know. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. the only reason I, I, I pause about the emperor's influence is if you just, if you study all of these ecumenical councils throughout history, you know, Constantine summons the very first one in 325 to, con to for where Arius is condemned. Constantine actually thought Arius was the orthodox, the correct answer. Or mm. Constantine came thinking Arianism was just Christianity mm. and was surprised to know that the bishops voted against him. And yet he let that stand. Constantine's son comes and tries to overturn this. And as long as his son has a lot of influence, uh, he has their own councils. And there are basically what we would call Arian councils that win the day. The emperor was an Arian. He thought all the empire should be Arian. But the other bishops never really conceded. I mean, the majority of bishops never really conceded. And so when he dies, they finally get another chance to have their councils. And, you, and if you repeat this with what comes later, after Nestorius, uh, Zeno is going to finally come along in the, in the early, well, late 400s, early 500s. He's going to have this issued statement called the Henoticon, where he says, look, let's all agree there's only one Christ. And don't say anything else. Don't say one nature. Don't say two natures. Just don't stop talking about this. And that just makes everyone mad. And no one agrees with Zeno. And there's more and more times where these sorts of emperors try to persuade what happens. And they are often able to control the church for times, but they never, you know, they rarely get their way in the end. So who knows? I mean, it, it, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, we shouldn't speculate. It, history is what it is. I mean, we, it's not yeah. what might have been, right? All right. So you're saying that in this second council uh, of Ephesus, some violence was used by Dioscorus with all the thugs that he brought from Alexandria. And precisely for that very reason, Leo says this is a robber council. I mean, it's just a yeah. bunch of robbers and criminals forcing people to sign documents uh, that you know they don't really believe and so on, right? And yeah, I, I, and if I could just if I could just insert one note because I would want to be sensitive here. Remember the the Coptic Church in Egypt. This they still defend hmm. Dioscorus and this council, um, and so they claim that the the acts of violence are over exaggerated. Yeah, so yeah. Um, according to all the records we have. Yes, they're exactly what you said happened. It was incredibly brutal. There is another side of the story that claims those are exaggerated yeah, records. No, so, no, but I mean, yes. I, it, but he, from the side of the uh, <laughs> of Polio, this council doesn't work, and they have to have another council. I think that's where you were going, and you're right. It, I'm uh, sorry to, for my Egyptian brothers, but you know, like uh, history is history, and if they don't like it, well, the document that's what the documents say. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> and, we'll have to have that. We'll have to have them come to the debate at some point in the future. Yeah, well, yeah, of course, of, the story. of course, of yeah. course. All right, so. Uh, once the emperor Theodosius is, is dead and the new emperor, I think his name, uh, Macron, I think it's his name, mm -hmm. uh, uh, along with his wife, Pulcheria, who is uh, Theodosius' sister. So they call a new council, this time in, in Chalcedon. So what happens in Chalcedon and, and why is it so important in the history of the church? Great. Yeah. So for one thing, this is, um, this is a much more representative council. Now, not everyone agrees with the council, but the vast majority of the Mediterranean world is better represented here. And most importantly, uh, Antioch is represented and Rome is represented and Constantinople and Alexandria, but this time Alexandria loses. Um, so Pope Leo's letter called the Tome, uh, it, it, it is its own sort of standalone book, but it's a short one. It's, a, it's really a letter he wrote to the, to the first council of Ephesus, I mean, the first council before that, the council of Ephesus in 449. So now uh, Chalcedon, his letter is finally read and uh, everyone there except the uh, Alexandrians, um, they side with this letter uh, and agree that Eutyches' stance is heretical and must be rejected. They once again uh, reject Nestorius. So just to be clear, when they talk about two natures in Christ, they're not saying what Nestorius said, two persons, they claim. And yet you can't swing the pendulum and go with Eutyches and say a mixture of these two natures. Hmm. So the, the sort of the, the, the most definitive statement about Christ in, in what is traditional Western uh, Christianity, Roman Catholic Christianity, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, even the Protestant traditions that come from that. This is the mainstream Christianity known uh, throughout our history is, is defined here at Chalcedon. Christ is one person with two natures and these, un these natures always remain united. So Nestorius is wrong and yet they never remain, they never are mixed. So Eutyches is wrong. Right. That's so here, the, the great winner appears to be Leo himself, right? Because, I mean, he got his way. However, yeah. there is one point that, as I was reading your book, it seems to me that he is a loser because it says that Constantinople is still 
uh, on the same level as Rome when it comes to ecclesiastical authority. So, you know, yes, Mr. Leo, you're right this time, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that you will always be or or, or he the head of this church, right? So how did uh, Leo take this and, and, and what follows after that? Not well. He, uh, this, this is one of the things that it's always uh, so complicated. When you say that finally the East and West and the whole Mediterranean Christian world uh, agree at Chalcedon, that is largely true. But remember, all of these councils sort of dealt with numbers of issues. So the, we, we've been talking about the main, the biggest hmm. heresy. Uh, but they would they would issue uh, what are called canons, canon law. They would issue canon rulings on all sorts of things, like even even what kind of haircuts monks could wear and clothes, and what what days you celebrate feasts on. So the very last one is a canon that declares what you say. It is basically a question of uh, you know Rome's authority and how others relate. Uh, and Rome never accepts that last council that canon. So they accept the council, but they pick and choose. They say, no, no, but not that one. Um, whereas the East does accept it. And so, yes, the whole uh, ecumenical world is allegedly on the same page when it comes to Jesus, just not when it comes to all of these other procedural matters. Right. No, the people in Alexandria did not accept, uh, or, or most right. people, I suppose, did not accept the, the decrees that were issued at, at Council. And I, and I think in your book, uh, you mentioned some some bishop or, or some priest from Alexander saying, if I sign that declaration, they will kill me over there. <laughs> to, that, to that level of fanaticism they had reached. And, and in fact, I mean, I, I know that later on they did kill some people that accepted uh, the, the two nature theory, right? So yeah. what, and, and here is where the non-Chalcedonian split happens and that's where we get the Coptic church in Egypt, right? So, so how did people in Alexander react to this, to, 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 mm -hmm. to the council of Chalcedon? Right, that's good. So I think at, if you are one of the bishops at the council of, of Chalcedon, you're assuming that this is gonna go like every other trial. So anyone who doesn't agree to this will be removed from their office and we'll just put in an Orthodox bishop in their place and all the people in all these cities and all these regions will just know this is the new correct teaching. Well, it didn't work this time. In Alexandria and in the, the wider uh, Egyptian world, um, when the emperor tries to install a new bishop, a new patriarch of Alexandria, I mean, there's riots in the streets. Uh, and so that, you're right. This is where the Coptic church, the, the Coptic speaking Egyptian church, uh, breaks off and has never reconciled again to Constantinople and to Rome and to those in communion with them. Um, and then there will be uh, for people in places like Syria and other places further east, uh, churches that aren't happy with Chalcedon and won't agree to it. And the next several decades are spent with emperors trying to appeal to them and appease them and make find some sort of compromise to bring them all back into the fold. But eventually you'll not only have the, the Coptic church in Egypt splinter from this group, but you'll have the Syrian church and others splinter from this group. And arguably they, they started here because they rejected it. but there was a lot of time spent trying to keep the band together. Right, because I mean, even though you're talking about all the consensus, all the ecumenical consensus was, that was reaching Chalcedon, that, that's not really the end of the story because for mm. at least 100 or 200 years, monophysites still survived throughout the whole Byzantine empire. And, and there were attempts to settle the issue, but they were all unsu unsuccessful, right? And that's why the Coptic church uh, persist to this day and that, that difference has not been settled. I mean, there were a few right. emperors later on, like uh, Justinian, for example, whose wife, uh, Theodora, she had sympathies for monophysites, right? And, and so this issue was not completely solved at, at, at Chalcedon, it went on. And, and right. even, even, even to this day, because there are non-Chalcedonian Christians such as, as the Coptic, right? Uh, there's right. another issue I wanted to ask you about. Uh, at Chalcedon, I think you mentioned in the book, or maybe I'm confusing your book with another one that I was reading on this, there appear to be some flip-flopping. And I'm thinking particularly of the Patriarch of Jerusalem. Now you've been talking about Rome, Constantinople, Antioch mm -hmm. and Alexandria, the, the big four, right? But there is a fifth right. one who might be on the lower level, but was aspiring right. to rise, which is Jerusalem, right? Yeah. And I don't remember the, the, the guy's name, but at the second council of Ephesus, he went on with the majority defending Eutychus and mm -hmm. siding with Dioscorus in all his violence and all that. But then when Chalcedon comes and they reproach uh, Dioscorus for everything he did, 
this guy, he says, well, yes, now I'm, I'm going to change side. And I'm going to be on the side <laughs> of the people who, who are against Dioscorus, even though I used to be on his side first. So how did this flip-flopping go and how common was it in, in the Council of Chalcedon? Yeah, so I mean, you right. So you have to remember these. This this is really sort of a, a dialogue or a dialectic because Nestorius, even before Nestorius, I mean, I, I I don't mean to give too long of an answer, but think about how uh, Nestorius shows up and there's these people calling Mary mother of man, and he says no, but we're not going to call her mother of God. So there's this pendulum swing. He tries to call her mother of Christ, but that still seems that sets up this new question. Okay is Jesus God? Is he fully God? So then in response to Nestorius, you have Eutyches, and people want to reject that. And in response to Eutyches, you have Leo, who sounds like Nestorius. And they're constantly using these terms that shift in their meaning. So we say God is one substance or essence, three persons, persona. Well, Christ is one person with two substances or natures, but the problem is the word for substance or nature was sometimes, it's the Greek word hypostasis, it's sometimes synonymous with person. So when, you when you're in the middle of all of this, I, I do feel sympathy for people like the Patriarch of Jerusalem, who, but you're right, his lowest in official ranking, even though he has some of the highest honors going back to the Jerusalem church, he's trying to say, well, which side am I on? And it depends on what you mean by so um, going back to Nestorius, uh, John of Antioch was certainly on Nestorius' side. And then when Nestorius is accused of taking this idea of two natures into two extreme of a view, two persons, John of Antioch says, well, that's not what we meant. And he ends up siding with Cyril, or at least coming to a, to a compromise formula with Cyril. So patriarchs like the one in Jerusalem, it's easy for us to kind of stand back with hindsight 2020 and, and say, oh, why are you flip-flopping so much? Um, and there are times, there's no doubt that they're testing the wind and they say, aha, everyone's going with Rome, everyone's going with Constantinople. It, there, there's no doubt that had to have influenced their thought. But again, here's where I take that sympathetic reading and saying, well, if you're in their shoes and you say, well, if everyone's going that way, let me look really, really closely at what we say. Oh, I could say this if by it you mean that. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I don't mean to be cynical, because if I were in their shoes and I have a lot of monks waiting outside the church, I would be very afraid to take the other side. So I'll go with the flow of the monks, but because I want to save my ass, right? I mean, I want to save my skin. <laughs> and and I, I wouldn't blame them for that. But I would say that precisely this survival mindset that they have is more powerful than theological conviction. I mean, that's at least with the case with the guy from, from with the Patriarch of Jerusalem. But anyway, that, that's it just- may be. You're, it, it may be. Again, it's just, there was so much confusion anyway. It's, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to know for sure. Right, right. Well, before we go, because this has been a fascinating uh, historical review, uh, there is one passage in your book that I, I found uh, very intriguing. And, it's towards the end of the chapter on the on, on the uh, Council of Chalcedon. You seem to acknowledge that mathematically speaking, both Nestorius and Eutyches made more sense than the Chalcedonian solution. I mean, if you think oh, yeah, about it, if you think about it, uh, Eutyches was saying, "Well, Jesus was fifty percent divine, fifty percent uh, human, and so fifty plus fifty plus fifty, a hundred. It makes sense." Whereas the Chalcedonian Perfect. position seems to be, no, 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 he's 100% this and 100% that. And mathematically speaking, uh, that's very bizarre because you can't have 200%, right? But you but, say no, that- They don't say that. They say he's 100% Christ. Right, yeah. but it's basically, I mean, Eutychus was saying 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 equals one. Whereas right. the Chalcedonian position seems to be one plus one equals one. And it should be right. two in mathematically speaking. Right. But you say, well, this is terrible math but terrific theology. Those are the words yeah. that, that you yeah. use. Yeah. Now, uh, I have to say, uh, for someone who's not religious like me, th this is nonsense. I mean, I, I, it ju I just oh, can't sure. put it in my mind. So, I mean, I, I give you the opportunity to, to defend yourself <laughs> from, oh, yeah. from someone like me who would say, well, this book is great history, <laughs> but that one particular paragraph, it's nonsensical for me. I mean, one plus one equals two at all times and 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 I could never accept one plus one equals one. But I mean I, I give you your opportunity to to make your case here. 
No, I, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to be able to persuade you. Let me just say that. And, 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 and what I stated in there, is, I also want to clarify is not, I, I am a believing Christian, so it is my belief, but it's not just my belief. That is, that is the math. That is the confession of the church uh, mm. throughout all time. So yeah, yeah, of course. what, what I think you, uh, we start with is the idea that uh, you say it's nonsensical. Uh, the, the definition of God for Christianity has always been that God is um, transcendent. God is, God is almighty. God is sovereign. God is uh, a, a word we you know, often use is immense, which uh, is literally um, from, from mens uh, in French, from the, the mental, it, beyond our ability to, to mentally contain God. God is too big. to. And so how could we imagine God incarnate? How could we imagine the infinite, finite? Uh, we cannot imagine that, but we Christians have always confessed that. So what we say is, even though we cannot explain it mathematically, in Christ, we believe we have God, God the Son, third person, the second person of the Trinity, uh, present with us, Emmanuel, and yet we also believe that he's fully human. So, you know, if you read on in my chapters to talk about the idea of him, he takes on this human nature. So now you do have one plus one is two, two natures, and yet we haven't added a second person, right? This is still the same God, the son from all eternity, who's come to be with us in the person of Jesus, who is suffering, who is dying on the cross, and who does rise again uh, on the third day. And so, yes, we believe that um, what, what we say about Jesus is beyond our capacity to explain, but we believe it by faith. And so when you, it, it becomes even more clear when you look at these other heretics, uh, Eutyches, Nestorius make opposite mistakes, what they are able to explain can be explained very easily. Oh yeah, but it doesn't match what is revealed about Jesus in the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. so it's heretical. So it's good. it's terrific math, but terrible theology. We would say what we believe is inexplicable. It is bad math, but it's it's pretty it's pretty profound. Belief. Sure, just out of curiosity, I mean, and this this takes us away from your book, but uh, this is something that I've struggled always with with people, very intelligent people who give an answer like like you have. Why should I believe you? on faith and not let's say islam on faith or judaism on faith or buddhism on faith i mean what if if there comes a point where you cannot persuade me to accept that particular religion uh why do you profess it above the other ones because they also make the same claim yeah sure it's a great question and i, I want to say up front i have the deepest respect for people who are of jewish faith and are of, of muslim faith and um you know, the, the history of religions and war, wars between religions has been a terrible blight on everyone's uh, history. So I think there has been a mistake in the past where people thought I have to persuade you or else I have to go to war to persuade you violently. Um, and I think human nature tends toward that, but we should admit that was never really the better uh, impulses of, of our religions. So uh, to, I appreciate your question, but I guess I would wanna admit up front the, the assumption in that question is that um, I should persuade you, right? It's not my job to persuade you. Um, in our belief, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict you. So, but it is my job to be a, a faithful witness. And this is what Jesus called his disciples to do is to say what they have encountered in Jesus. And when we tell others about what we have encountered in Jesus and what God has done through Christ's death and resurrection, then we trust that the spirit will um, convict other people and uh, help them to see that this is true. But apart from that happening, I couldn't convince you that it's true. And people who come from Muslim uh, faith and Jewish faith, I think they are saying something similar. And if you're comparing, well, what, what we Christians claim is we saw God in the person of Jesus. And even though the Roman empire and the powers of the world tried to kill him and put down his movement, death itself could not stop this. He rose on the third day. So if you believe that witness, that testimony, that must be the spirit in you enabling you, convicting you to believe that witness. Uh, and I say amen to that, but I hope my witness is, is one of respect and not one of uh, coercion. Right, but just on a final note, but do you agree that you're right and they're wrong? I mean, for some reason, well, you're not a Coptic. Yeah, of course. Because, I mean, no. you do believe that Eutychus was a heretic. So it's not like everybody's right. Like uh, some people, all religions are right. the same. No, I mean, you no, do no, believe no. that you're right no. and they're wrong. No, of course. Yeah, of course, I believe that. But I believe that by faith, not by... Uh, some sort of scientific rationale that I've proven mine is more reasonable than theirs. 
Right, but were people in, in Calcedon and, and was, was that what they were thinking? Because it seems to me that if they were deliberating so much, somehow they were aspiring to prove through rational argumentation that both Nestorius and Eutychus were wrong in what they were saying. I mean, this was, this was not just pure faith. I mean, they were using philosophical methods of uh, persuasion. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so they believe that our faith is reasonable and can be articulated to, it can be shown to be not irrational. And what you do when you step into an, a council, a Christian council, now this is an in-house debate. So we all agree on the same prior commitments. We all agree Jesus is uh, God with us. He died and rose again. And, and since we believe in the same scriptures and the same commitments, now what is the best way to articulate this, right? So I don't share those same commitments with a Muslim or with a Jewish person. So it's harder for us to have that kind of in-house rational debate if we don't start from the same commitments. Right. Well, Dr. David Wilhead, it's been my pleasure. Before you go, let me show you again our, our viewers the cover of this book that we've been speaking about, which is The Gospel According to Heracles. We only talked about half of this book because the other half, or even, even I mean, even, not even half, even less than half, because there are yeah, other areas. Is. Yeah, that there are other chapters related to uh, the, the iconoclasm controversy and the Aryan controversy. Uh, it's been my pleasure. I, I urge our viewers to get this book because I have enjoyed it, at least those two chapters, which are the ones that I've read. I've enjoyed them through. And I look forward to reading the chapter on Arius. And maybe we can later on speak about that one particular chapter because the Aryan controversy was even more important than this Christological controversy that we've been speaking about. All the best, Professor, and my pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Yes. All right.